I'm Luca and uh, last time I mentioned two experiences that I did on scaling, one in, one in Ferrari, the other in ThoughtWorks, both involving the whole organizations. Uh, um, we talked about the three things the last time. We went uh, through some uh, element of the agile theory of simplicity. Uh, very quickly, if I have to mention just one thing, I will remember to you the definition of Alistair Coburn that make a distinction between framework and methodology. A framework is something that you read on a book that is defined that it is the same for everyone. The methodology is what you apply in practice for your team. Is this all the set of conventions that are agreed uh, by the team uh, and it is the result of adaptation of the framework to the specific circumstances of the team. In order to do this, every framework is intentionally incomplete to leave room for this adaptation. And this is one of the key elements uh, of Agile. Uh, agile simplicity is what makes Agile. Then we gave a quick overview of uh, uh, some case studies. Uh, some case studies of companies that you see on the left that achieved agility at scale successfully. What it means successfully? It means that from a business point of view, you can see that they are fast, uh, adaptable, dynamic, resilient, and also they are financially successful. And we saw, we, we had a look at those companies and we noticed that all those companies achieved that agility not following one framework and not following any scaled framework. Instead, what they did is they grow their own way of working internally, eventually taking inspiration from some of the lightweight frameworks and following or being congruent with lean and agile mindset but no one by the book and no one use scaled framework. And then we had a look at other companies that took a completely different route. They went heavy weight uh, with the scaled framework or also from a technological point of view. And all those companies uh, didn't achieve any tangible uh, benefit for the business. Uh, there was no sign of agile mindset and there was no sign of autonomy for the team or technical excellence. Basically, those four companies, I would say, have failed uh, based on the definition of success. And finally, we went through uh, a set of uh, expert opinion on SAFE, negative expert opinion. To sum up, uh, all the op negative opinion uh, on uh, scaled frameworks and on SAFE specifically is that uh, uh, you cannot find any one single leading expert that advise to use SAFE. I added my own personal opinions uh, and I pointed out uh, some element, uh, this idea of upfront roadmap, uh, agile release trains that from a technical point of view are, uh, I mean, we have DevOps and continuous integration, uh, safe requirement model that is going back to waterfall, uh, PI planning that is extremely inferior to alternative, uh, alternative practices such as lean inception or simply inception or, uh, sorry, um, Google design sprint. But worse than that, uh, SAFE tried to accommodate the dependencies instead of removing them. One of the key points of Agile is a set aligning teams, uh, improving technical excellence, aligning team with technology and with products so that uh, you have uh, uh, very little dependencies. You cannot succeed when you have many dependencies. You are doomed. Then uh, uh, looking at the role, we saw some example how uh, SAFE uh, had the additional layers of management instead of bringing you to a flat organization. And we talk again about how SAFE is uh, 
an outdated digest of content that is primarily available already for free in the Linagile community. And uh, to close, just not to be negative, uh, we also give a hint uh, about what are the alternatives. So I would like to um, ask you yourself uh, to think about uh, um, the team that you are working with and look at the uh, delivery initiative that the team had in the last year or so two. How many of those initiatives involved one single team? How many involved two teams or more inside your unit or department? How many of those initiatives involved instead many units? So, I'm trying to ask you the question, what is the scale that you are facing? If the majority of the delivery initiative involved one team, so your scale is one team. If most of the delivery initiative involved few teams, that is your scale. If involved multiple department, then that is your scale. And this gives you an idea of what is your current scale. But then when we start to think about what we should do, there are things that we should do to check if your current scale is the right one or if you are just there because of incidental dependencies, because uh, people from business and product area uh, use uh, the idea of economy of scale, economies of scale that come from the industrial age, but in software development and digital product, instead we have these economies of scale. What I'm telling you, it is possible that your current scale is artificial, is not real. So what the company should do even before starting to scale, should start to question their current scale and then should check if through technical excellence or through uh, the coupling and related product, they can already the, the scale instead of scaling or through technical excellence, basically reduce 10 times the size of the code base uh, once the technical depth has been solved. And then question if there is still a real need for scale, or if in the cases where there is still need to scale, once you have done those things, you put yourself in the best situation to start the scaling on the right foot. If you just uh, jump into scaling without uh, trying to solve uh, technical uh, uh, debt, without removing accidental dependencies, without the coupling product, products that has been coupled uh, uh, artificially, uh, you will very easily not get the benefit that you expect from scaling. And finally, this is the last bit. Assume that you really want to scale what approach should you use instead of using a scaled framework? Well, from the theory that we say, the, that we mentioned before, you should always start small. Try to make things work in one team, at least, because if you don't have something that is working well, you have nothing that you can scale. There is nothing to scale. If you are in a mess, you could only scale that mess. So start small and then, grow experimenting, learning and adapting. When you experiment, learn and adapt, do not look at scaled framework. Instead, look at lean and agile principles, look at the theory of complex adaptive systems and look out at uh, uh, the agile community that provide you uh, a knowledge base of patterns and other things that can you eventually, you can try, you can experiment and see if they work for you. And I think this is a, a fair, uh, quite faster recap. Any question about the recap so far? Can you see the screen with the questions? Yes. So, yes, Luca. So, so I had too many open windows. Sorry for that. No worries. Let's start with the first one. Corrado, if you, after the, after the answer, if you just take the question out, that could still be usable. So let's start with the first one. Which one is the most popular skillet framework currently? 
any specific reason for its popularity. Um, recently, there has been the version one uh, annual report, uh, and the SAFE uh, uh, currently has 30% uh, in terms of popularity of the uh, commercial scaled framework. But uh, uh, there are also many companies that use hybrid approaches. Let me check if I can see. Let me check if I can see uh, the hybrid approaches. Does anyone in, does anybody know the this information? Sorry, it does help if I unmute. Um, from what I can remember of the version one surveys in the past, um, a lot of the hybrid approaches generally have Scrum and some other stuff. A lot of people just use Scrum and XP. Um, I don't think much has changed since the last time I looked at the version one report in anger. Um, some people uh, say they're using Scrum and Kanban and XP. So that's, that's a combination that gets mentioned a few times. Um, a percentage have been using kind of unified process type things like disciplined agile delivery. So there's a small cluster around that. I think some people claim they're using lean as well, but again, um, I haven't see, looked at it in a couple of years, so I don't know what the numbers are, the percentages, but that tends to be, there's also, from what I can remember, a, a, a fairly reliable, like five or 6% who say they're not using anything. Um, okay. I found it now. Ooh. Oh, cool. Awesome. So basically to support what you were saying. Can you, can you see it? Uh, yep, we can see it. So, oh, even more than 30%, 35. I can remember when Rational Unified Process was incredibly popular, <laughs> measured by the number of training courses sold. It did. <clears throat> and then we have uh, um, Scrum or Scrum and don't know that uh, it, it's a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of hybrid, a lot, a huge percentage of the hybrid. Discipline and Agile is dying uh, because it's going uh, less lower and lower it was five percent before it was 10. less also is not in a great shape and i think that scrum of scrum we don't even have a scrum at scale i don't know the way that i will interpret this is that we have two big players we have definitely safe and on the other side we have hybrid approaches all the other commercial approaches are kind of a, an incredible minority, are irrelevant. Would you agree with this? Anyone want to comment more? Do you think that's actually because SAFE offers training and people feel comforted by being trained in a thing rather than necessarily people are like, well, we've learned the training, we'll do the thing. Whereas I, I feel like the other methodologies where even when they do offer training, they're less comprehensive. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one possible reason. Another reason I come many years ago when there was Microsoft versus Linux and for a lot of people, uh, Microsoft provided a comprehensive documentation of everything. Linux was uh, uh, much more chaotic. Uh, and uh, so a lot of people preferred to stay with Microsoft until the point that internet was so innovative that the uh, documentation of Microsoft was always out of date with the reality, with the technology that people was going to use today. And I think uh, that reflect, I, I don't know, maybe it's similar with Agile. A lot of people don't feel comfortable to go to the Agile community and the continuous and chaotic innovation that is happening there. And they trust uh, SAFE to provide them with uh, that. I think it's also an inspired name, isn't it, SAFE? People, have, people just feel safe. 
So I will um, say again. Uh, it's also an inspired trade name. I mean, safe is just a good name. Um, you've got to admit that. And yeah. what I've heard is, and I've, I've observed this in a couple of large organizations, tried to transform uh, to a large scale agile organization. Um, safe means you don't need to let anyone go because there are lots and lots of jobs for everybody. Yeah. Look, uh, hello. Can you hear me, Luca? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, Luca, uh, I, I, uh, thank you for, for the comment. Um, the, the other thing that uh, I've heard of SAFE is that uh, it gives the senior management uh, a warm, fuzzy feeling at the program level. Um, so um, it's, it's that, I think that's one, one of the ways that it's sold from what I'm led to believe. So um, it, rather than just being IT centric, it, it gives you a framework beyond that you know, to the high level planning and maybe dovetails more easily with some of the banks which are more hierarchical and less likely, more rigid in the way they work. You've got a managing director is all powerful. And, 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 and you know, it's almost, I don't want to say hybrid, but it, it, it lends to that kind of structure. And I know a couple of banks that have uh, headed that way, you know, with SAFE. <coughs> Yeah, there, there is a book uh, or an author, uh, Ralph Stacy, that uh, you may have heard uh, about the matrix, Ralph Stacy matrix, and uh, he studies uh, uh, management science and the dynamics of organizations and how uh, traditional management have a, a set of uh, assumptions why when we look at complex systems and we see how they work the assumptions are very different but management and a lot of people that come from that traditional management feel extremely uncomfortable uh, with the, all those assumptions so uh, see this is probably, i think this is congruent with what you say uh, top management feel uncomfortable to feel to change the assumption on budgeting on the way that plan the way that they, know, they deal with portfolio so why safe make them feel more um, comfortable because safe do not change the way of working that's the reality agile is a uh, uh, has a lot to do with the complexity science, human complex adaptive systems, and all the work, modern work in management science that Ralph Stacy documented in his books. Look so, at that is, uh, sorry, so, look, at, look at that is spot on because uh, you touched last time on, I don't know whether it was your talk on the target operating models and agile target operating yeah, models. And yeah. this touches on this point because what we look for at the senior level is a roadmap of the architecture and where it's going to be in five years and three years and the spend that we're going to do. And that spend could be tens of millions of pounds in terms of the hardware and things. So if something can still give us those, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I think that just, uh, it's worth adding a bit to that one. Uh, it, it's not that SAFE doesn't change the budgeting it's very easy for you to not have to change your budgeting strategies while and adopt safe because all the financial stuff, the primary source of all that Intel is a guy called Don Reinhardtson who, who did some really good work. It's, it's a while ago now, it's maybe 10 years ago now on um, product development flow of words that effect. And his take on accounting and taking that economic view is, a lot of that is in safe, but it's very hard to get to that point because that's all at the portfolio budgeting level. And organizationally, that's a governance question, which is very hard to change for a, 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 a large structure that has a very uh, complex interconnected network of governance elements. And so you can't just change a bit of governance in one place because it's a system problem. Yeah, oh, on that topic, um, um, it's true that the theory is there and this brings us back to one of the characteristics of SAFE that it takes a lot of good idea from the agile community but the way that those ideas are integrated uh, goes against the original idea so let me uh, be specific on what uh, you just talked about about budgeting modern budgeting and modern planning 
recognize uh, the unknowns and the uncertainty and recognize the importance to involve people on the ground and at the ages of the organization in the budgeting and planning process. So even if you have a three-month rolling budget and even when we work with strategy, we need to involve more people in the process. So this is going toward the direction of uh, uh, Stacy, and this is going toward the direction of a modern uh, agile adaptive organization. But then SAFE, what does SAFE does? Involve product managers, involve teams extremely late, have the three layers of uh, uh, roles in the hierarchy to separate uh, uh, the project managers. Look at the product owner. The product owner that in a normal company is empowered to look at the product and then to talk with the upper management and say, look, this is where the product is going. This is the input that I'm giving you in order to, uh, to contribute to the strategy of the organization and so to contribute to the reflection in the, in the budget, right? That's what the product owner does. But in SAFE, a product owner, it becomes the owner of a user story of an epic. It becomes uh, uh, one that push, uh, push the paper. Uh, any more thought? I'm, I'm challenging. Uh, I'm adding to what you say, uh, Zach. Any thought on this? Yeah, I mean, um, so I think we're drift uh, this is kind of drifting our mind onto the question of who the customer is in environments where you have any kind of scale delivery thing going on because the customer stops being a direct part of delivery, right? The, the notion of a customer or the notion of a, a product strategy becomes a proxy for a customer. So I think some of the, what you're saying, I think is a side effect of ending up operating at that scale. The product owner isn't the customer anymore. Um, the product owner, when you're talking about multiple teams trying to do stuff in whatever their delivery methods, that they have, if they're if if they're reasonable, a bunch of hypotheses about what their eventual customers might need, um, and that degree of um, uncertainty in what needs to be done is quite a difficult thing to actually make any kind of progress or headway in. Because you know, if you're faced with a, an infinite series of options, like what do you do first? And I think it's human nature to suddenly go, right, I better narrow this down. I'll work on this thing. This thing being a story or a feature or an epic or, or whatever it else. And I think that narrowing stuff that you're talking about happens much more easily because of the This is where the, our good friend Tom Gilb comes in with stakeholder analysis. You know, you don't have one customer any longer. You've got lots of stakeholders who have an interest in having good value delivered to them. And so he's provided a with, with tools to estimate, you know, both the cost and the uh, and the value delivered of, of each thing that you do with the with the development. Um, it's, it's worth having a look at gilp.com to see how they do that. And if you look at, uh, oh, sorry, uh, carry on. Yeah, he's also recently given a series of lectures on the subject, um, which are nice, easily digestible chunks of uh, of videos. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, I was going, just going to add to that one that um, if you look at sort of like traditional companies, the vast amount of effort that they spend or artifacts that they produce are designed around their internal processes. So they're very inward facing entities. So most of the stakeholders are other parts of the business rather than the entity that gives them money and on the outside. Yeah, that's, that's properly true. What, what I'm thinking is that um, um, many element of SAFE uh, uh, seems to sustain uh, the current approach. I heard what you suggested. JIT is one of the first that did Agile. I think he invented the Agile idea even before Agile existed. And uh, you also, Zach, you mentioned um, that the lead, uh, lean thought leader, uh, that also suggested good ideas, but all those layers in uh, uh, in the hierarchy, all, all the, these additional roles, uh, all those additional process make it harder to implement also the things that you suggested. 
I don't think that the uh, user story product owner has the authority to involve all the stakeholders to have those uh, workshop uh, to come up come up with uh, uh, strategies, ideas, and talk with the upper management in safe. Because when PI planning reached the team, everything has been already decided. And the people that made that decision is three, four hops away from you. There is no way for you to have a chat and say, look, I have very good idea. I have very good insight for you. We should change. Or look, we did an experiment. Uh, everyone had a look, all the stakeholders had a look at the experiment. It didn't work. We need to steer. It's too late with SAFE. Oh. I think we beat it to that, uh, these, these questions. Unless someone have an opinion that uh, want to add, anyone has a burning desire to add an opinion on this? I, I think I think for me personally, for me personally, this is uh, the thirty-five percent you may uh, you show it. If you go actual in a company, it might be five percent. I think the rest of the thirty percent, they have been measured because they're saying, okay, we are running safe as globally. But actually, in theory, you're uh, most of the company are not doing properly a proper safe. So they have not implemented safe as per the book. So I think it's maybe it's five, ten percent that you can actually pin it and say, yes, it's safe. Breathing and living safe, nothing else. Uh, and then what is the consequence of these? Uh... I think it's a broken agile and spending a lot of funding. This is my view. And also on the top of that, yeah, it gives the fuzzy good feeling to the leadership because it's commercially, they can go back to a research and saying, but we are doing the same as everyone else. But they're spending more money than maybe in waterfall. If you, if you calculate a broken save, how much money they're spending in comparison to really good waterfall, they're doing the new shiny thing. As you said, they're not connecting with the customer and so on and so on and so on. So I don't, I, I'm not believing that is 35% of a company is doing a real safe end to end. I think they just tick the box. Yes, because this is the way to make a fuzzy, to have a fuzzy feeling. Yeah. This will be my view. It's, when you go, there is no CIO in top 100 that will say that are not doing uh, agile. But we all know on this call, what is the percentage of companies, not the ones that you show on your uh, slide, the like the top ones, but the real companies, not the like the new trendy companies, they're really doing agile. We all know that this is not true. <laughs> So this is for me, it's yes, on paper, there are so many companies because commercially viable. But in reality, if you go and do analysis, maybe it's 5% of any company they're doing agile. This will be my view. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, a minority. And um, it's interesting that uh, maybe talking about who is doing agile uh, is not enough anymore because otherwise it happened what you just suggested. The question should be who is doing good agile and not even not uh, agile by the book. I, I wouldn't be worried if a company doesn't uh, do agile uh, safe by the book or doesn't uh, do uh, Scrum or extreme programming by the book, that I love extreme programming. The question that for me is more interesting is, are we doing good agile? That may be different even from the book. The point is, is that good? I think it's the cost of doing a broken agile. How much does it cost the company <clears throat> implement a broken way of working because it's actually costing them more. The rework and also the, even the turnover of people, uh, they're fed up with a broken agile. If you 
calculate the cost, I will bet you that maybe 50% of agile initiatives are doing worse maybe than some of the small waterfall, but I'm, I mean not the yearly waterfall models, but maybe three, four months waterfall models. So not I because I don't like agile, but just saying. Iterative development. Yeah, be. because for me it's like agile, it's amazing, but if you don't have a stable team and every single time you move your trains and teams and whoever it is, then you start from scratch. So what is the cost of that? No one calculates that. But this is huge cost because you haven't recorded everything, you haven't measured everything, whatever it is. You don't know what has been done, what is your goal, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So, so yeah, what we are talking here, the concept that we have explored is the difference between good agile and broken agile. And I think that resonates with all time agilists uh, like us, that th that's our goal to do. Why, why are we bashing uh, safe or something? It's not that we don't like something, it's to go back to what was the initial intent of all these. That was to do good for knowledge workers and to do good for the industry. That is exactly what you discussed before, talking about cost of uh, good or broken agile. And I think that's a very good uh, reflection. I would like to move uh, exactly. to, the next, to the next questions, uh, uh, just to move on and also to give the opportunity to, uh, for everyone to have their topics discussed. Sorry, the question is, what would you say are the key challenges of scaling agile in an organization that is growing quickly? So a quick, uh, fast growing organization what challenges are facing when scaling agile? Any one of you is uh, in a fast growing organization or has been in a fast growing organization? Anyone that want to share their experience before I share mine? I sound in my current uh client place where they are a product manufacturing company and they do uh, sales and support side. So they, this is the two sides of the coin where I see Agile is useful on one side of the coin where the product development side and the research and everything, but not on the service and marketing side. That's where we use most of the projects of fall into water ball and split off Agile. It depends on what is my scope and how the end customer is need is. So we, are, I see quite a, a fast pace of change in the delivery methodology and also the quality of the pro outcome of the pro deliverables. So, what challenges do you see? If I understood correctly, in the <coughs> marketing, you see it more challenging to do agile. What type of challenges uh, do you see? I mean, when the customer is keep on changing his uh, target uh, deadlines and uh, the deliverables and the requirements are keep on changing. When you have a fixed budget on the planning side, you are unable to use the agile methodology to 100% to scale up the project and deliver. Only certain element, what we did, I was working on a program which is having three verticals. Two verticals have successfully gone live in the waterfall. And one of the vertical, what we were, uh, initially thought is we will move everything into Agile because it's a first phase. We want to deliver in a waterfall uh, to some part of the program. And the next phase of the program is always reusable components. So there we thought we move the waterfall methodology to Agile methodology so that we will save a lot of uh, resources, human resources and planning and every time and everything. But in one of the stream where we struggled a lot is mainly the requirements are not clear. The, based on the assumption, the project uh, principles have built up that particular stream mainly. And they started building the agile uh, sprints and everything and they started delivering the project. But I'd never seen that project has successfully delivered in line to the customer need. And the customer is not happy as I saw on the waterfall for the initial phase. So, which is a tricky situation. And also the 
<clears throat> client is also learning the agile adoption overall that's where i see a lot of challenges and opportunities internally for the client to use the 100% safe agile so again it's a different uh, bag of combination where i saw on it's tricky yeah yeah any anyone ask that uh, faced the company that is growing quickly and want to come the only thing, from uh, yeah. the only thing i'd say is that uh, just taking a wider view uh, rather than just fixed budget uh, where the governance process is not changed so um, that includes your budgeting includes your contracting with your suppliers uh, includes uh, the, the um, top layer not being bought into uh, fail fast, fix fast. You know, all those things combined, um, you tend to get a lot of hurdles along the way as you um, say, okay, we've got this new uh, methodology that we're going to be using called Agile. And these are the, uh, the principles that we're going to be doing. Everyone's super excited about it, or a few people are, and a few people know about it, and the others don't. Um, and the la lastly, it's around business engagement. If business aren't ready to engage you uh, without um, looking at helping you break down those barriers, you're going to be up against uh, a lost cause, aren't you? Yeah, um, is a, is what once I, I used the term of impedance of traditional way of working, and uh, probably when you are working when you are making a contract with someone else, it's easier that the contract is approaching a traditional way of working, and that are uh, obstacle and obstacles, of course, and it's in a in a way it's sad that. Uh, uh, safer, for example, I find uh, unhelpful instead of uh, becoming a tool uh, to teach upper management uh, to teach uh, to teach them about the new paradigm where you can plan and strategize at high level in a way that is lightweight, in a way that is informed by many point of view, in a way that have an experimental mindset and have an inherent ability to steer when things change, when new information come available. That's what we would like in an organization that is fast and adaptable. And that requires a different approach to contracts, a different approach to budgeting, a different approach of human resources. When we see human resources just as a resourcing of people, of headcount, to fill fixed box for a project, and so on. And I find it a, a little sad that traditional or current scaled agile framework instead, uh, especially safe, end up instead reinforcing uh, the uh, old way of working. Another topic, so I, I just put it there. Uh, there was someone in the previous session, I think it was from ThoughtWorks, and the ThoughtWorks recently grew up more, and uh, uh, someone uh, mentioned how is challenging to maintain the company culture when you are growing quickly. It's even harder if you want to create an agile culture, so create a new culture, and then to keep that culture when a lot of new people is coming. How do you balance giving freedom to people with the need to align them? Sorry, anyone want to add something about uh, these questions about challenges of scaling agile, especially on fast growing company? So I'm helping a couple of like startups and uh, what my uh, observation is, they want, it's a motivational, but it's not a hobby. And usually the leadership are so busy of selling that they can install the new culture to become a hobby. And this is the critical. All the leadership of a new startups, they know that it's amazing to deliver Agile because at the moment, most of them are not delivering in any form and shape. They're just running to get the next sales, to get the next thing. But they know that the Agile sounds really good. So they're motivated. They're motivated like going to the gym. And yes, I will lose weight, but you don't lose weight until you actually it becomes a habit. 
And I think also a lot of the new companies, they're not experienced that they have to create this culture in order to be competitive. So this is my view. It's motivation versus habit of agile. Yeah, good point. Anyone want to add uh, something on this topic before we move to the next question? No, so I think well, we I look at. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. also that when you are scaling, you are introducing some constraints that uh, maybe teams uh, should be forced to you to follow. For example, when you are one single team, you can decide your own architecture, your own tool, uh, or what else. But when you are scaling, and maybe you have five, ten, twenty teams working together maybe it's harder that uh, every team can each team can pick their own uh, tool their own architecture their own practice or what else if they have to work together but coming back to your question if they are working on different products they are not really scaling they are adding more lines and not uh, not really scaling yeah thank thank you corrado so when when the number of people involved grow the balance between alignment and freedom may change a little and we need a little more alignment or the benefit of alignment become uh, bigger that's what you are suggesting is that correct corrado yes it if actually it's also the reality I mean, if uh, you have uh, 10 teams that are working on the same product, maybe it's not really useful that one team is using a language, another team is using another language, uh, or uh, from the technical perspective, it's easy to understand that, that you have uh, to share something. And maybe in your, in, for you, it's not for your team, but it could be, let me say, for the whole group teams, it's the best. Yes, um, your comment make me remember another point uh, that is important, uh, uh, that while we work uh, at team level, we can focus on the team aspect. We should make it work at team level. When we start to involve multiple teams, it becomes essential to coach and to facilitate and to have people to collaborate across team. One of the outcome of this collaboration is come to the agreements that you just described at Corrado. But there are also agreements about delivery initiatives, uh, dependencies and priorities. So recently, I don't know if you saw a, a post or an article recently with problems related to Spotify. And the Spotify, this article describes how Spotify, for some reason, specializes to match teams and end up in a situation when they have too many dependencies. But no one coach, trained, or facilitated team members to cooperate with each other. And also the theory of human complex adaptive system says that a huge impact on the outcome comes from the way that different teams, different units collaborate with each other. So yes, the structure is important. Yes, the processes may have an effect, an impact, but the biggest impact in the end is the interaction between individuals and across teams and uh, uh, departments. So that's definitely one thing that, uh, Corrado, you make me remember that is definitely important. Luca, that, that is the best point you've so far. Yeah. Uh, the intercollaboration of teams, particularly at the you know, cross-program level, uh, particularly when we're delivering regulations in the bank and the way that regulates the uh, deliberately layering the regulations so that one builds on top of another. This is critical for the success of adopting any framework in, inside. So thank you for that point. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Corrado. 
Where, 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 where would you start then? I mean, what are the what top three things that you would do to overcome these multiple layers of issues? Sorry, can you repeat a little louder? I didn't get you, Vivek. Uh, sorry, I'm saying that one of the top three things that you would do to overcome this because it's so complex um, that, that where, where, I mean, obviously it's always, always good to start at the top, but where would you start? How would you make it simple very quickly? Simple to deal with dependencies and collaborate across team. Is that the question? So, yeah. in Agile, very quickly, there are two ingredients. Uh, there is a huge literature in Agile to tackle the problem at two levels. The first level is technical, to remove technical dependencies or to relax the dependencies so that the team are much more autonomous. And the second element, uh, uh, quickly described by Conway Law, is to create alignment between the architecture and the team to reduce the number of dependencies. This thing is the thing that differentiates the traditional approach from uh, the Agile approach. Agile makes an incredibly huge effort because we know from Standish Group and uh, that when there are too many dependencies, failure is almost certain. The second element is that uh, coordination and cross collaboration in the agile way has a strong focus on the human aspect. So we realize that different uh, um, projects, different initiatives and different dependencies requires different approaches. If you hire the right people, if you bring them together and if you, and if you ask them, given these dependencies, what is the best way to handle this, they will figure out the most effective way. Agile suggests a, a few ways. The traditional approach is to set up a standard process. Please, uh, this is a big topic. If anyone want to add something, jump in. Look, I would, I don't know if this fits into Agile, but at, again, at the higher level where we do cross collaborate across programs, uh, we would have the different working groups. So we would have an architectural working group, we would have a regulatory working group, and you know, a lot of the key stakeholders from finance, front office, uh, data teams, IT would be at these groups so that the coordination and is passed down you know, and this is where the uh, cross fertilization occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the agile element, uh, um, I, I, I'm asking you if the agile element is there. The agile element will be that this group are not only a top down groups, uh, but these groups involve also people that is doing the actual work. So you see what's really working on the ground uh, and the collaboration is uh, uh, unscripted. So you ensure that the collaboration happen, but you let people shape the collaboration based on what is working. The, the right collaboration should emerge based on what is working well. So to recap quickly, collaboration end to end, not only the bosses on the top, but also those doing the work on the ground and collaboration as scripted. Uh, the type of collaboration emerged from what is working on that context and circumstances. If anyone wants to add something, go ahead. Otherwise, we move to the next questions as usual. Yeah, Luca, if you agree, just because we have 24 questions in the queue, can we follow the, a link coffee approach? Maybe we can start with 10 minutes for uh, a question and then we can expand other five minutes. On the contrary, we will not be able to go through all of them. Please, Corrado, facilitate Please, Corrado, this. Corrado, facilitate this. Yeah, I will keep the time, okay? So if there are no more questions, I will move to the next one. Yeah, and the next, the next one is, what are the important things to understand uh, scale portfolio management? Any comments? 
scaled portfolio management. So we are talking about when we manage a portfolio of products and we have to decide and direct investment budget or simply priorities. The question is, what are the important things to remember to get it right, I assume? Any ideas, any comment? on what worked and what did not work in the past for you? Well, actually, the Lean Portfolio Management in SAFE is one of the most successful practice <laughs> for a leadership perspective in SAFE. So it's really curious that. Actually, I asked a similar question. It's much further down, and that was sort of why I asked it. I asked, was there anything you thought that if you were taking little bits of any scale frameworks that you thought were good? And that was actually the thing that I had in mind, is actually I do think SAFE does portfolio management and gives some guidance when often people don't do it at all. I don't think they manage their portfolio at all. It's literally an absence of it, which I think leads to a lot of the other problems that we've talked about. Um, uh, and so while I'm, I'm with you, I don't love safe. Um, that is one aspect that I'm kind of like, I do quite like that. And it's sort of ready to bake. And I don't actually think you have to do the rest of it to do it. Um, can you add, uh, sorry, go ahead. All right, no, I was just, um, I was just, I just remembered um, a, like a, a load of work done by a guy called Richard Durnell a while ago, and Dan North's been talking about this sort of stuff, uh, talking about why agile doesn't work at scale. Or there's some to series of talks he did on that like five, six years ago. Um, and this is for me, it's a really interesting one because the people in an organization that have to make or, you know, governance type decisions. Where does money go? Do we, uh, do we kill uh, this piece of work because it's not going to deliver the expected benefits, or it will deliver late, and therefore we need to do something else? The ability to make that decision, I don't think, fundamentally changes because they're looking at predictions into the future, um, variances against these predictions, um, returns on investment. These are all trying to look well a long way into the future to gauge it and so the best thing i think that deliveries irrespective of delivery strategy agile what for whatever is how does it feed useful intel so that portfolio management can continue to function because it has a certain degree of success based on you know what for based deliveries because it had a certain amount of data which may or may not be accurate, who knows? There's like a lot of variances there, but they are trying to make those, this project is late, it'll never get back on track, let's kill it. You then have politics at play, but let's park that for now. So I think the intent, the underlying intent of that level of the organization has always been sound because that is what allows an organization to remain commercially viable because they need money. Um, so I think the things to understand from a delivery or an execution perspective is how do you surface up leading indicators that actually your bit of this program or your bit of this portfolio of work is on track, is late, is early, is going to cost more, is going to cost less, so that that decision can be made. And there's always going to be errors in decision making like that because they're not based on absolute certainty, they're based on predictions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I got a couple of points, but before going forward, Claire, Claire, can you tell which element you find useful of the Lean Portfolio Management of SAFE? Before I play the devil's advocate and uh, I point out to the problems, can you instead be the voice that point out to the things that uh, you find useful in SAFE uh, Lean Portfolio? So actually, exactly something that I'm going to build on that Aaron said, I, I think actually an assessment of whether you should continue on with doing work that I think it provides a structure for making those decisions when in actual fact, if left to its own devices, often the um, sunk cost fallacy takes pre precedent when you actually don't have to do any kind of meaningful um, uh, assessment on, on whether that's really providing you with value. And I'm not saying that 
safe's the only way to do that. I, I, it wasn't really that I was saying that, that I think that that's the best or it was more that I, it's, it seems when I'm talking to clients and I'm talking to other people, I, I see that it's an easy thing for people to understand and how to do it. Um, you know, I want to do sort of like more about weighted job first and stuff like that. But uh, often people find that hard to get their head round and other things come into play. You can see the biases coming into play. So that was really my aspect of why, why I don't hate it. Like, <laughs> it's not that I don't like it, I don't hate it. Yeah, uh, good, good point. Uh, you are helping me to reflect to the point that I would like to point out later. Corrado, you also made a positive comment. Uh, uh, I will also like to hear your positive comments on the safe uh, uh, lean portfolio management. Well, actually, I think that the fact that you can pivot on a quarterly basis instead of uh, a yearly basis, as usually are managing the budget in traditional way of working, think, make, make think people that in this way they are agile because they can change <laughs> in the meantime okay so this idea i think is really really welcome from leadership because they say okay so we have not a budget a yearly budget we have a quarter budget and so this probably is a misunderstanding so without problem for in my opinion this is a misunderstanding but the idea that they can uh, let me say change the configuration of the budget uh, in the middle of the year and there is, and that there is a framework that permits this. It's uh, it's something that uh, people like it, le leadership like. Okay, then I play the role of uh, pointing out uh, uh, the negatives. Uh, I played that role. Um, what is missing? Well. One thing very simple is that if you lean, if you read Lean Enterprise, uh, or you don't need safe really to apply uh, a lean approach to portfolio management. Uh, you can find uh, those guidelines in the book Lean Enterprise uh, from O'Reilly, uh, Jets, uh, uh, Humble. Uh, so it's not something new. If you uh, another point uh, that I would like to point uh, that is specifically to SAFE. Uh, SAFE uh, provided this decision. So there is uh, those activity of lean portfolio management, uh, but then there are other things that remain in place. Why it is different to change a priority? Um, Aaron, you mentioned politics. Uh, so a big thing of the work of uh, uh, Stacy. Uh, a big part of his work is to realize uh, that politics uh, uh, is also what people do to deal with plans that are disconnected to the reality and they have to do politics in order to try to make uh, a predefined budget, a predefined uh, uh, plan uh, uh, work with the changing requirement and changing reality. So the politics is not something that happened randomly. There are some rigidity in the organization that uh, lead to politics. And one of those rigidity is to have uh, uh, rigid uh, uh, roles, rigid management roles, uh, uh, budget assigned to management uh, instead of a budget assigned to delivery initiatives and headcount assigned to manager traditional management. So what happened if you are that traditional management when someone come to you and say the priority is changed? Well, from your point of view, it means that someone is taking away some of your budget and someone is taking away some of your headcount. While you are still expected to achieve the same goal in order to get the bonus or to move forward with your career. And of course you have to fight that if you want to get your bonus, if you, have to, if you want to move ahead to your career, or if you want to fulfill the need of the customer that you are given. So you see, by one side, the safe give you the opportunity to change things, but on the other side, it leave all those rigidity that make it painful for people to deal with those changes. 
an agile approach uh, will make uh, management adaptive, will focus on products and goals, and will focus on uh, uh, career progression uh, on a different way. So the problem with SAFE is that it leave in place all the things that create this uh, uh, mismatch. And that's more cultural. Now, very quickly, I mentioned a few other things. Uh, the SAFE approach- Yes, to Luca, I'm adding five minutes, just for your information. I'm oh. adding five minutes. No, no, let's follow. No, no, let's no, ask no, let's uh, follow. if people want to hear more or if, if we should move to the next one. Okay, okay, so we can do it in this uh, easy way. We can use the chat, uh, and if you want to continue, you can type yes or why, or if you want to move to the next topic, you can type no or and. Make sense? On chat, yes, if you want to give five more minutes on this question. Yeah. We we have next 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 Luca. Perfect, I love it. Okay, I love it. great. So let's move to the next topic. Save is Luca. considered the facto framework for implementation of SAP like system. How can management get confident in anything else without proven stats? My, my quick answer is that there are no proven stats that safe work. And when you, see the, when you see the use cases, they are not convincing at all. So why someone should be convinced uh, to do something different that safe? Agile is working, it's 20 years that Agile is delivery for many organizations that do, do Agile. It's safe that have to prove that it works. So I think that's an interesting um, point. And the, I think the reason why that will never change is that this is not a rational data-based decision. I mean, it's a variation of the you'll never be fired for buying IBM. I'm being a bit blase and flippant about it. But if you've got this perception that a third of all the agile implementations are using the safe thing and in the kind of highly rarefied atmosphere of um, buyer and decision maker, um, if you haven't got the time or the energy or the inclination to actually drill into tangible data to say, right, okay, 30% of safe imp um, programs fail, not safe implementation, safe programs, and this now the other, you're not going to spend the time, which means that this is this is this is a, a limbic system type decision right this is an emotional type of decision which means that any decision any argument that's based on facts or data will just get their backs up and they'll double down on that decision so i don't think you can i think you just have to ride it out yeah good point and uh, yeah actually uh, i would like to add uh, something uh, the more context uh, to the question uh, because uh, the specific example which uh, i was trying to uh, seek the opinion about uh, sap it's like a, a, a court system right uh, i mean uh, commercial uh, uh, over the counter software and uh, we have a host of uh, courts uh, so uh, majority of the time uh, when a big organization uh, goes for such uh, course implementation, uh, they look for uh, SI, a system integrator, uh, so because this uh, IT is not their forte, so they would rely upon uh, some IT services companies' help uh, to adopt such courts, which is alien to uh, their uh, uh, legacy setup. Yeah. Uh, so in that context, of what uh, comes as an ecosystem from SI is like we have the accredited resources with the knowledge of uh, uh, SAFE, uh, which goes very well uh, with your implementation plan, even if it's a green field, brown field, doesn't matter, but it goes well because you could get the predictability of uh, how your pipeline will look like. And as we uh, boast on the experience of having these accredited resources deployed uh, to drive this, uh, so you should have more confidence in our abilities than someone who is trying to tell you 
uh, we can uh, transform your organization to have this implementation uh, without any framework. So that that was uh, basically the context I was trying to uh, get more uh, answers from. Uh, I mean, uh, um, what you are saying, uh, um, the the what what you are saying basically has to do with the promise of predictability. And uh, yes, safe promise you predictability. The question is, does it deliver that predictability? And we know that it does not. Uh, uh, in the same way that traditional waterfall approaches in a world that is changing fast and not <coughs> every delivery. If you are doing a delivery that you did that 10 times before, you know everything up front, uh, you can do waterfall. If you're living in a modern world uh, where COVID may happen, when a lot of things may happen, where the system we are hyper connected as consumer things constantly change no in that case a safe give you the the promises of predictability but it's not delivering on the devil's advocate side of things you know don't forget the fresh kind of value statement in the manifesto right so if you've got the right people with the right mindsets then it doesn't matter what processes they follow i know i'm just being a bit flippant there but i think the effect, the ability for a team or a set of teams to react to uh, emerging conditions like uh, an SAP implementation, um, the method itself might delay them uh, a week or two um, at a time, but it doesn't necessarily break their inherent ability to cope with it. Um, I think some of the other challenges are just in how SAP implementations work because another problem with that particular ecosystem is it is very heavily dependent on the careers and financial stability of the SAP consultants who make a good living from it. Um, a bit of random history, SAP have tried in the past to re-architect SAP. Um, they've been unable to do so because of the consulting market that has grown around it. So I think in this scenario, it's very difficult to fundamentally change that because you're not trying to change one client buying one SAP implementation of a thing. You're trying to change an entire ecosystem of the product, all of the supporting packages, and all of the consulting people who have based their careers on it to fundamentally operate with a different mentality and operate with different sets of labels on their processes. I, I have a important. strong opinion on the same point. Uh, I do work on the ERP platform uh, most of my career, especially on SAP or Oracle or Salesforce, whatever the ERP market it is, in the consulting side. I see there are mixed opportunities around when you go on a greenfield implementation from an SI. But when you see as an end user customer perspective, I see there is an opportunity on the safe perspective for the business transformation, like an operational transformation area. That's where you can use the waterfall on the product delivery of the ERP package, any package solution to deliver to the customer as a greenfield. Waterfall is the best approach. What I personally feel when I seen the large scale rollover, multinational, uh, multi global environments, but only the area where I see the waterfall doesn't fit in that particular transformation exercise is the business transformation. When I say business, the operational and the roles transforming from one to another due to the nature of the new product, new uh, technology coming into the, uh, into the business that changes the roles and responsibility of every day, what they are doing over a period of time using on the legacy platforms. So that's where I see uh, the safe will be there on the operational perspective, but not on the technology perspective. I personally feel waterfall when you're going on a greenfield. But again, the, the safe is useful when you are seeing on the operational improvisation area when you already have a SAP product brought over a couple of years ago and you want to do enhance the product, but not upgrading the product. Again, when you are enhancing the product, you have a regular windows of delivery to the system where again, you can bring in your agile methodology of development and delivery cycle. That's what I seen on a delivery side. So these are mixed areas where I see 
opportunity and there is non opportunity on the safe perspective or the waterfall perspective that's my personal view what i seen over the last 20 years where is exactly fitable and where it is not suitable in an erp whether it is a saas or whatever it is a saas or whatever it is yeah thank you for sharing rado sorry Rado. yes 10 minutes it's over again as before we can use the chat windows to continue or not please type yes no or next okay we have a couple of next okay yes move on next topic okay and remember you can have a look at the yeah, question and still vote them, look at the them. The next question is why do you the think the state uh, uh, Corrado I think there is a little uh, echo Yeah uh, thank you why do you think uh, safe framework is the most prominent why not uh, scrum at scale uh, nexus or less well um just to remember the previous pre uh, picture safe is the most prominent uh, in terms of uh, commercial frameworks there is a last uh, a bigger majority of people that is using an ad hoc method whether it is a good ad hoc method or a bad one uh, we cannot say but they use a custom method so safe is the prominent among the commercial frameworks and um, the next question is about success metrics for agile and agile outside it agile is not an end it's a means and your company know why they think agile will help to achieve the goal the metrics should depend on the goal that the company want to achieve I personally ag agree with that because your organization has a purpose whatever it is right uh, sell things make things whatever if they can do that more effectively because of a different way of working then they are going to be more effective as an org so I'm with you on that one the headache that I think for me when I read that is the entity in the organization the buyer who decides that they need to change their way of working to be more agile i'm uh, simplifying for brevity instead of opening up many more cans of worms it's like they will need to justify spending a certain amount of money on some form of transformation however it might look uh, so i think that is a reason for needing them it's not a measure of how agile you are it's a series of measures that help you justify an investment in changing your ways of working that's what i can see out of this so uh, a way to say that is that we have a waterfall program to implement agile and we want a matrix to see how the program is uh, is going on potentially yeah um i don't know if it will be waterfall with an actual end state because i think these numbers if they're being if it's turned into a number it'll behave in an on an asymptotic curve it'll never be maximum agile that's impossible so it has to be something where you you stop improving at the rate that you were before because your improvements are a lot more nuanced um but i think there's a threshold by which point you can say we have a we're better statistically significantly better at delivery than we were a year ago or two years ago or whatever that there has to be a way of trying to say something like that without turning it into a a number or a kpi that somebody gets paid based on anyone want to mention some uh, metrics an example of metrics that uh, can be useful uh, uh, yeah uh, look at uh one one aspect that we haven't discussed is the project assurance thing that we have in the waterfall and this touches on Arun's point so uh, we used to have like a minimum bar and a maximum bar on the minimum number of things that a project should do in terms of the terms of reference uh, the uh, the project plan level 1 and level the more detailed uh, etc and maybe i'm thinking that safe may offer you the similar kind of framework that project assurance which is an independent team can come to any part of the organization and say how agile are you compared to this list 
I know that one of the banks used this quite, quite, uh, uh, you know, properly as a, as a, as a form of doing this. Yeah? So it's a checklist to say, well, do you use a Camborne mode? Yes, I do. Do you have uh, two week sprints? Yes, I do. Do you do reviews? Yes, I do. You know, that kind of thing. To make sure the processes are working properly across the organization. For me, those are the visible signs, right? That's the stuff on top of the iceberg, the observable things. But the because Agile is more like a, a, about culture, mindsets, uh, behaviors, and things that are beneath the surface, you can't directly infer that from just those measurements. Um, you can have perfectly... Uh, linear thinking folks that stand up every day for 10 minutes um, I, and it on the surface it looks like it's a tick so yeah I you might be able to over time show that there's more of these activities more of these uh, artifacts and events happening which might suggest a greater degree of adoption um, but th I suppose that's more at more like trend analysis rather than absolute measurements Yeah. Well, uh, yeah um, sorry. Sorry. Um, one other point, uh, and forgive me because this is from a delivery point of view. Um, yeah, we've not mentioned the Jira stack as a backlog and stuff like that. So, would it be uh, metric of how many of the Jiras that you've cleared over a particular thing? Um, so, I think. Yeah, I think I some know, people have mentioned like. Um, sorry, I was looking at the comments. Uh, cycle times and flow rates. Okay. You as a team are more productive now than you were a year ago then you could there's an argument for saying that your new way of working is better than your old one um, but that can easily be gamed right just write smaller tickets um, and then you can get to more of them so there's way that you have to work out how it is being gamed because any measure gets gamed the, yeah the the limit with the measuring the progress on the backlog uh, is that uh, uh, you can do the work, but you may not achieve the goal. Is an item backlog done when the goal is achieved or only when the work behind the backlog item is done? So that is a reflection. Sorry, Aaron was raising it. Please go, Aaron. Oh, no, thank you so much. And I, I really want to uh, say thank you for this fantastic conversation here. Um, so. One of the things, so we use the backlogs, but we try to keep them very tactical and in shorter time frames. Um, and then one of the things we like to do is link a lot of the value stream KPIs, which we feel those ones can have, um, you know, those can tie closer, you know, feedback loops, uh, especially around, you know, clients. And we'll use a lot of, you know, portfolio Kanban uh, boards to kind of establish the portfolio initiatives. And if we can link that, I mean, it's not, it doesn't happen every time, but if you can link that to kind of the business outcomes around the investments, it's like you can start to build this value chain, so to speak, or, you know, uh, uh, or a chain, I should say, of, of the value stream KPIs. Does that, does that make sense or no? Yeah, to me. Seems you are connecting the concept of doing agile, agile to the business outcome that you want to achieve. Exactly. And then, and then if we get that moving, uh, we'll sometimes, you know, it's, it depends on the leaders, but <clears throat> we can then link the strategic themes. And then that's when you can get to a more enterprise portfolio strategy uh, where, you know, everything kind of starts to become a little more harmonized because then you can go to budgeting and you can link all those pieces together to justify why, you know, we're moving X dollars to Y, you know, themes. And, you know, if everybody agrees because the logic is rational, <laughs> then you tend to get the good, you know, a, a more aligned organization. And what we found is if you can link the performance, this is where it gets harder. It's harder to do that with individual developers, but you could do it with teams. But then you're right, people will try to game the teams Right? They'll try to move around to go to the cool themes. And sometimes there's just work that has to get done that isn't you know, cool, but is still critical. And that's where I found some of the value stream KPIs maybe don't work as well, is a lot of that maintenance and support kind of you know, BAU operations, um, a lot of the value. So I've tried to tap more into the old school quality 
like old school, old school, like pre six Sigma even, because there's a lot there on the quality that you have to maintain just to have reliability. Uh, because if you don't have that, then you're wasting cycles and resources just maintaining that. So it's actually like a negative cycle function, it's called. Any more comments or, on these or should we move to the next question? Sorry. I take the silence as a no, so I skip it to the next. Uh, yes, time is over. Yes, I was saying just that. Time oh, is over. Then I think it's a good time to say uh, goodbye to everyone and thank you very much for uh, uh, all the comments and the insight that you provided. Yes, sure. Um, let me add just one uh, comment that next week uh, we are going to, to have our last event before the summer break. Um, it is on a completely different topic. It's about get things done that is, uh, let me say, it's reductive, I know, but it's a time management methodology. Uh, so something really practical and uh, there will be a lot of insights that you can take away with you after uh, the meeting, some tricks on how you can better manage your time. This is, this is just to remind you what is going to happen. And uh, thanks a lot, Luca, for uh, facilitating this uh, conversation. It was uh, really, really interesting. And uh, also because we shared, we really shared our experience, our thoughts, so really, really helpful. And uh, so I hope to, to see you next time and uh, have a great night. What can I say? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Luca. Thank, Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Ola.